man can be happy, more happy than the words, more happy than the trees, more happy than the stars, because man has something which no tree, no bird, no star has. Man has consciousness. But when you have consciousness, then two alternatives are possible. Either you can become unhappy or you can become happy. Then it is your own choice. Trees are simply happy because they cannot be unhappy. Their happiness is not their freedom. They have to be happy. They don't know how to be unhappy. There is no alternative. These birds chirping in the trees, they are happy. Not because that they have chosen to be happy. They are simply happy because they don't know any other way to be. Their happiness is unconscious. <clears throat> it is simply natural. Man can be tremendously happy and tremendously unhappy. And he is free to choose. This freedom is hazardous. This freedom is very dangerous. Because you become responsible. And something has happened with this freedom. Something has gone wrong. Man is somehow standing on his head. You have come seeking meditation to me. Meditation is needed only because you have not chosen to be happy. If you have chosen to be happy, there is no need for any meditation. Meditation is medicinal. If you are ill, then the medicine is needed. Buddhas don't need meditation. Once you have started choosing happiness, once you have decided that you have to be happy, then no meditation is needed. Then meditation starts happening on its own accord. Meditation is a function of being happy. Meditation follows a happy man like a shadow. Wherever he goes, whatsoever he is doing, he is meditative, he is intensely concentrated. The word meditation and the word meditation come from the same root that is very significant. Meditation is also medicinal. You don't carry bottles of medicine and prescriptions with you if you are healthy. Of course, when you are not healthy, you have to go to the doctor. Going to the doctor is not a very great thing to brag about. One should be happy, so the doctor is not needed. So many religions are there because so many people are unhappy. A happy person needs no religion. A happy person needs no temple, no church. Because for a happy person the whole universe is a temple, and the whole existence is a church. The happy person has nothing like religious activity, because his whole life is religious. Whatsoever you do with happiness is a prayer. Your work becomes worship. Your very breathing has intense splendor to it, a grace. Not that you constantly repeat the name of God, only foolish people do that, because God has no name. And by repeating some assumed name, you simply dull your own mind. By repeating His name, you are not going to go anywhere. A happy man simply comes to see God is everywhere. You need happy eyes to see Him. 
what has gone wrong? I have heard about a man who became very famous in Germany. Even today his statues are there. And some squires and some streets are still named after him. His name was Dr. Daniel Gottlieb Sreber. He was the real founder of fascism. He died in 1861. But he created the situation for Adolf Hitler to come. Of course, unknowingly. This man had very pronounced views on how to bring up children. He wrote many books. Those books were translated in many languages. Some of them went into 50 editions. His books were loved tremendously, respected tremendously because his views were not exceptional. His views were very common. He was saying things which everybody has believed down the centuries. He was the spokesman for the ordinary mind, the mediocre mind. Hundreds of clubs and societies were set to perpetuate his thoughts, his ideas. And when he died, many statues were installed. Many streets around the world were named after him. He believed in disciplining children from the time they were six months old. Because he said, if you don't discipline a child when he is six months old, you will miss the real opportunity of disciplining him. When a child is very tender and soft, unaware of the ways of the world, make a deep imprint, then he will always follow that imprint. And he will not even be aware that he is being manipulated. He will think he is doing all this of his own will. Because when a child is six months old, he has no will yet. The will will come later on. And the discipline will come first, then the will. So the will will always think, this is my own idea. This is corrupting a child. But all the religions of the world, and all the demagogues, and all the dictatorial people of the world, and all the so-called gurus and the priests, they all had believed in doing this. This seems to be the basic cause why man is unhappy. Because no man is moving freely. No man is sensing, groping his path with his own consciousness. He has been corrupted at the very root. But he called it discipline, as all parents call it. He believed in disciplining children from the time they were six months old in such a way that they would never after question their parents and yet believe that they were acting of their own free will. He wrote that on the first appearance of self-will, one has to stop it immediately, kill it immediately. When you see the child becoming a person, an individual, you have to destroy the first ray of his individuality immediately. Not a single moment should be lost. When the first appearance of self-will is noticed, one has to step forward in a positive manner, stern words, threatening gestures, rapping against the bed, bodily admonishments consistently repeated until the child calms down or falls asleep. This statement was needed only once or twice or at the most thrice, the doctor told to people. Make the child so afraid 
shake him to his very roots. And those roots are very tender yet, a six-month-old child. Treat on him with gestures, with a deep hatred, enmity in your eyes, as if you are going to destroy the child himself. Make it clear to the child that either he can live or his self-will. Both can be allowed to live. If he wants his self-will, then he will have to die. Once the child comes to know that he can live only at the cost of self-will, he will drop his self-will and he will choose survival. That's natural. Survival one has to choose first. Everything else comes secondary. And then one is master of the child forever. From now a glance, a word or a single threatening gesture is sufficient to rule the child. What happened to his own children? Nobody bothered. Everybody liked the idea. Parents all over the world became very enthusiastic and everybody started trying to discipline their children. And that's how, according to Sreber, the whole Germany was disciplined. That paved the way for Adolf Hitler. Such a beautiful country, intelligent, became a victim of a fool who was almost mad and he ruled the whole country. How it was possible? It is still a question which has not been answered. How he could rule so many intelligent people so easily with such foolish ideas? These people were trained to believe. These people were trained not to be individuals. These people were trained always to remain in discipline. These people were trained that obedience is the greatest virtue. It is not. Sometimes it is disobedience which is the greatest virtue. Sometimes, of course, it is obedience. But the choice has to be yours. You have consciously to choose whether to obey or not to obey. That means you have consciously to remain the master in every situation whether you obey or you disobey. What happened to his own children? Just now, the whole history of his children has come into light. One of his daughters was melancholic and her doctor suggested putting her in a mad asylum. One of his son suffered a nervous background and was institutionalized. He recovered but eight years later had a relapse and died in a madhouse. Another of his son went mad and committed suicide. And the autopsies of both the sons proved that there was nothing wrong physically with their brain. Still, both went mad one died in a madhouse, another committed suicide. What happened? Physically, their brain was perfect, but psychologically, they were damaged. This mad father damaged all of his children. And that is, that is what has happened to the whole humanity. Down the centuries, Parents have been destroying people. They were destroyed by their parents and so on and so forth. It seems a chronic state. Your parents were not happy. Whatsoever they knew made them only more unhappy and more unhappy and they trained you for it. And they have made a replica of themselves in you. 
Arthur Koestler has coined a beautiful word for this whole nonsense. He calls it Bapu Kresi. Bapu means father. It is an Indian term. Indians used to call Mahatma Gandhi Bapu. This word Bapu Kresi is perfect. India suffers more than any other country from Bapukresi. The Indian leadership is still suffering from their Bapu, Mahatma Gandhi. Each child is destroyed by the Bapus. Of course, they were destroyed by their Bapus. So I am not saying that it is their responsibility. It is an unconscious, chronic state that perpetuates itself. So there is no need in, of complaining against your parents. That is not going to help. The day you understand, you have to consciously drop it and come out of it. Be an individual if you want to be happy. If you want to be happy, then start choosing on your own. There are many times you will have to be disobedient, be. There are many times you will have to be rebellious, be. There is no disrespect implied in it. Be respectful to your parents, but remember, that your deepest responsibility is towards your own being. Everybody is dragged and manipulated, so nobody knows what is one's destiny. What really you always wanted to do, you have forgotten. And how you can be happy? Somebody who could have been a poet is just a money lender. Somebody who could have been a painter is a doctor. Somebody who could have been a doctor, a beautiful doctor, is a businessman. Everybody is displaced. Everybody is doing something that he never wanted to do. Hence unhappiness. Happiness happens when you fit with your life. When you fit so harmoniously that whatsoever you are doing is your joy, then suddenly you will come to know meditation follows you. If you love the work that you are doing, if you love the way you are living, then you are meditative. Then nothing distracts you. When things distract you, that simply so that you are not really interested in those things. A real person takes the courage to move with things that make him happy. If he remains poor, he remains poor. He has no complaint about it. He has no grudge. He says, I have chosen my way. I have chosen the cuckoos and the butterflies and the flowers. I cannot be rich. That's okay. But I am rich because I am happy. This type of man will never need any method to concentrate because there is no need. He is in a concentration. His concentration is spread all over his life. 24 hours he is in a concentration. Man has gone completely topsy turvy. You forget the intrinsic values of your life, your happiness, your joy, your delight. You always choose something of the outside and you bargain with something of the inside. You lose the within and you gain the without. But what you are going to do, even if you get the whole world at your feet and you have lost yourself, even if you have unconquered 
all the riches of the world and you have lost your own inner treasure, what you are going to do with it? This is the misery. If you can learn one thing with me, then that one thing is to be alert, aware about your own inner motives, about your own inner destiny. Never lose sight of it, otherwise you will be unhappy. And when you are unhappy, then people say, meditate and you will become happy. They say, concentrate and you will become happy. Pray and you will become happy. Go to the temple, be religious, be a Christian or a Hindu and you will be happy. This is all nonsense. Be happy and meditation will follow. Be happy and religion will follow. Happiness is a basic condition. With me, happiness comes first, joy comes first, a celebrating attitude comes first, a life affirmating philosophy comes first. Enjoy. If you cannot enjoy your work, change. Don't wait. Because all the time that you are waiting, you are waiting for Godot. Godot is never to come. One simply waits and wastes one's life. For whom? For what you are waiting? If you see the point that you are miserable in a certain pattern of life, then all the old traditions say, you are wrong. I would like to say the pattern is wrong and try to understand the difference of emphasis. You are not wrong, just your pattern, the way you have learned to live is wrong. The motivations that you have learned and accepted as yours are not yours. They don't fulfill your destiny, they go against your grain, they go against your element. Nobody else can decide for you. All their commandments, all their orders, all their moralities are just to kill you. You have to decide for yourself. You have to take your life in your own hands. Otherwise, life goes on knocking at your door and you are never there. You are always somewhere else. If you were going to be a dancer, life comes from that door because life thinks you must be a dancer by now. It knocks there but you are not there, you are a banker. And how life is expected to know that you will be a banker. God comes to you the way He wanted you to be. He knows only that address, but you are never found there. You are somewhere else, hiding in somebody else's mask, in somebody else's garb, under somebody else's name. How you expect God to find you. He goes on searching for you. He knows your name, but you have forgotten that name. He knows your address, but you never lived at that address. You allowed the world to distract you. God can find you only in one way, and that is your inner flowering as He wanted you to be. Unless you find your spontaneity, unless you find your element, you cannot be happy. And if you cannot be happy, you cannot be meditative. 
why this idea arose into people's mind that meditation brings happiness. In fact, wherever they found a happy person, they always found a meditative mind. Both things got associated. Whenever they found the beautiful meditative milieu surrounding a man, they always found he was tremendously happy, vibrant with bliss, radiant. It became associated. They thought happiness comes when you are meditative. It was just the other way round. Meditation comes when you are happy. But to be happy is difficult, and to learn meditation is easy. To be happy means a drastic change in your way of life. Abrupt change, because there is no time to lose. A sudden change, a sudden clash of thunder, a discontinuity. That's what I mean by a sannyas, a discontinuity with the past, a sudden class of thunder, and you die to the old and you start afresh from ABC. You are born again. You again start your life as you would have done if there was no enforced pattern by your parents, by your society, by the state, as you must have done, must would have done, if there was nobody to distract you. You have to drop those all patterns that have been forced on you, and you have to find your own inner flame.